So good night and good morning to everybody that is uh, listening uh, or watching us through the Micro Judy's channel. Uh, we are very happy and excited for tonight's event. We're having a great panel. So we hope you join us from beginning until end. Um, we're gonna be uh, tonight having a conversation on the insular cases, odious and wrong with voices from the territories. So my name is Atabeira Medina. I'm the CEO of Micro Juris. Uh, we are a Puerto Rican company dedicated to providing access to law and legal debate uh, in Puerto Rico, Chile, Argentina, and Venezuela. And tonight we have experts, uh, the, the most uh, experienced people from the territories uh, that are going, we're going to talk about the insular cases from a, per, of a different perspective. Um, so I'm going to introduce our speakers. Tonight, we're going to be talking uh, from American Samoa with attorney Charles Ala Ilima. He is a co-counsel from, Amer he is a, uh, an attorney from American Samoa and is a prominent uh, attorney who has practiced law in the territory for 43 years. His public service includes serving as assistant attorney general, district judge. He was the first Samoan acting associate justice on the high court of American Samoa, president of the American Samoan Bar Association and representative to the American Bar Association. His private practice focuses on land and title disputes, corporate matters and general litigation. He currently serves as co-counsel in Fitisemano versus the US. Hello, Charles, and welcome. We'll also be talking to Representative Sheila Babauta. She comes from Northern Mariana, she's talking from uh, the Northern Mariana Islands. And the Honorable Sheila Babauta was born and raised on the island of Saipan and currently serves in the Northern Mariana Islands House of Representatives. She is a leader in protecting the land and culture of her people. Representative Babauta shares the national, the Natural and Cultural Resources Committee and is the chair of the nonprofit Friends of the Marianas Trench. In 2021, she introduced former President Barack Obama at the Global COP25 Climate Summit in Glasgow, in Scotland. She joined an amicus brief of officials from US territories in support of the Fittismano versus US case. From Guam, we have Neil Weir, president and founder of Equally American. He was raised in Guam and is the founder of Equally American, which advocates for equality and civil rights in US territories. He is the co-author of the forthcoming casebook law, casebook Law of US Territories, which he was, which he has taught at Yale and Columbia Law Schools. He is co-counsel in Fitisamanu versus U.S., which asked the Supreme Court to overrule the insular cases and recognize a constitutional right to U.S. citizenship for those born in U.S. territories. From Puerto Rico, we have Lia Fiolmata, Senior Counsel in Latino Justice, PRLDEF. Lia is a Senior Counsel that has contributed to amicus briefs related to Puerto Rico in cases before the United States Supreme Court. For example, US versus Valle Madero and the Court of Appeals for the First Circuit. For example, in the case of Centro de Periodismo Investigativo versus, versus the Fiscal Oversight and Management Board. She also delivered the keynote address in a symposium held earlier this year by the Colombian Human Rights Law Review on the future of the insular cases. From the Virgin Islands, we have Brian Modest, Director of Insular Affairs in the House Natural Resources Committee. Brian hails from the US Virgin Islands and has more than 30 years of public service experience working on territorial issues in the US House of Representatives. He is currently the Director of Insular Affairs for the House Natural Resources Committee, which is shared by the Honorable Representative Raul Grijalva, and is, as you know, the Committee of Jurisdiction for US Territories. Last year, the committee held the first ever congressional hearing 
focused exclusively on the insular cases. As, as it considered HR 279, a house resolution condemning the insular cases. Okay, so welcome everybody. Thank you for being here in this panel. Um, so as a brief introduction, as you know, or you may not know, the insular cases uh, are decisions from the US Supreme Court that span from 1901 until 1922. So it's been 100 years since the last of the uh, more important of the insular cases that established a differential treatment between territories and those uh, residents from the US mainland. Uh, expressions uh, describing tribal uh, differences, uh, racial differences uh, justified uh, or even not, not knowing uh, a lot about the Anglo uh, legal culture justified uh, the Supreme Court to determine that the territories would not be considered as equals in terms of the applicability of constitutional rights. So since then we have congressional um, uh, interpretation and judicial interpretation uh, being very problematic in terms of uh, the rights of people that live in the territories, which has, as we have seen in the territories, caused uh, controversies regarding uh, applicability of certain rights uh, and as well of federal programs, uh, different treatment in federal programs. So what we want to address today with this panel and our participants from the territories um, is uh, we want to address the issue of the insular cases from the perspectives that touch upon the, the residents of the territory's lives, such as issues like climate change, disaster relief, um, issues on racial justice uh, and self-determination. Uh, mostly the insular cases are known in the territories for issues of citizenship, but the discussion on the repercussions of the insular cases is broader than the issue on citizenship. Definitely the infrastructure for this unequal treatment relies upon the insular cases. So clarification and uh, further study on the effects of this doctrine uh, is very much needed. And this has to uh, be more broad. The discussion has to be more broad and more inclusive, um, not only in the legal networks that we all belong to, but also uh, in different uh, sectors of the civic society. So um, let's begin dis discussing. I think we lost Charles uh, from, the, from the transmission. He's trying to join back on. So oh, okay. uh, he'll join us shortly. I think he just needs to be let in. Uh, he's in the waiting room. Okay, good. These are things that happen. We're in different time zones and uh, in different uh, um, situations as well in terms of infrastructure. So um, one of the things that from Microjudis, we thought that this panel was very, uh, very much needed is, as you know, Puerto Rico just faced another hurricane. So we are in the context again of, uh, of natural disasters and disaster recovery. In this scenario, uh, we see the climate change uh, vulnerability in which islands uh, are posed and the inequality uh, through which territories are considered uh, in federal programs uh, that deal with disaster recovery. We also saw uh, the 2022 US Commission on Civil Rights Report uh, regarding the aftermath of Hurricane Maria, for example, in Puerto Rico. And we have heard a lot about the experiences with disaster in the territories in terms of differential treatment. Um, so, we're gonna begin uh, with Lia Fiolmata uh, that can lead this conversation uh, from the Puerto Rico experience and the disaster recovery experience. Lia, what can you tell us about this issue? 
Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think one of the most important things that I would like to highlight in starting our conversation this evening is, as you mentioned, the different treatment and the discrimination, quite frankly, against the residents of Puerto Rico and the management and the delivery of services on behalf of FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And you mentioned the you mentioned one report. I would like to actually talk very briefly about the two recent reports that have come out that are really important and very uh, relevant to this discussion. First of all, I want to say that the federal government's failure to adequately prepare and deliver services is directly linked to the fact that we are considered second-class citizens. No matter what people say, no matter what the government leaders tell us when they visit us very briefly, we are definitely considered second-class citizens. And this is one area in which we can see that. So for example, the report from the United States Commission on Civil Rights, which was published just recently on September 21st, compared FEMA's response to Hurricanes Harvey and Hurricane Maria. And so I will just mention uh, the most important or these I believe that are the most important um, facts that were revealed through these reports to demonstrate the disparate treatment towards Puerto Rico and the territories. For example, with Hurricane Harvey, and I do wanna say I'm not minimizing at all the devastation and the suffering as a result of Hurricane Harvey. This is about talking about the government response. So in Hurricane Harvey, um, approximately 68 people died. There were approximately 68 deaths in Texas. Whereas in Hurricane Maria, there was close to 3,000. The official death toll is 2,975. In some uh, statistics, one can see even a larger number. Of course, in both places, there was a lot of devastation due to flooding, et cetera. We know that in Puerto Rico, 100% of the power grid failed for many months and we also know that there was no cellular communication and that almost, almost all of the roads were impassable. 97% of the roads in Puerto Rico were impassable in the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Maria. So the commission studied the results, right? The uh, treatment of FEMA and found that the response was completely inequitable in the with respect to the two disasters. That the disaster response to Harvey in Texas was uh, on a larger scale and was much faster than the response that was given to the victims in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria. For instance, um, they compare some statistics from nine days after each of the respective storms. And in that period of time, FEMA had approved for Harvey victims in Texas, $141.8 million for assistance. And at the same period of time, nine days after Maria, FEMA approved $6.2 million for individual assistance. So we have 141.8 for Harvey, 6.2 for Maria. And then that's obviously we can see the disparity right there. Um, another detail was that survivors of Harvey received $1.28 billion in aid within two months of the disaster of Harvey. And survivors of Maria received $1 billion in aid within four months after landfall of the hurricane. Um, the commission studied and found that between 2017 and 2019, approximately 250,000 Puerto Ricans from the island migrated to the United States mainland. So, um, and even to this day, we know that part of the problem that also happened in Puerto Rico currently is that a large amount of the disaster assistance from Maria hasn't even been dispersed yet. Um, the power grid was so fragile and the foreign company, energy company Luma has been so ineffective that the entire island lost power as a result of Fiona, which was a category one storm. Um, the second reports, and I, I'll just take a few minutes to highlight this, that also was recently released, is from the Department of Homeland Security from the Office of the Inspector General. And this report was issued on September 29th. And it was an audit to determine to what extent FEMA had properly used funds that were devoted to case management relief called the PRDCMP which is Puerto Rico Disaster Case Management Program. So a study was done and the audit, the audit revealed the following, that FEMA had mismanaged funds, a large amount of funds. What they studied was FEMA had received or was awarded 72.8 million funds to provide to nine providers in Puerto Rico. And their audit encompassed 65 million 
uh, of those funds. And so the results that they discovered were that FEMA completely mismanaged funds in several ways. For instance, FEMA did not effectively manage the funds. FEMA did not reconcile advance payments with actual costs. FEMA did not have adequate documentation to support its costs. FEMA did not have adequate internal controls of the funds and did not properly manage its records. And these are just in general terms. The report is very specific. One of the problems that they found was that FEMA served as both the managing as well as the oversight entity related to these funds. And we can obviously know how what that can bring, right? And so um, the Office of the Inspector General found that FEMA had no assurance that the seven that $17.1 million paid to providers was disaster case management related and that they were necessary, those funds, and also that FEMA could not ensure that the remaining $47.9 million of this case management disaster funds were adequately supported. So increasing the risk of fraud, waste, and abuse of funds. So I think I'll leave it there You know, for now. Uh, we could talk a little bit more later on if you'd like, or if you want me to talk now about uh, the response of, uh, to Fiona, yeah, so, particularly so wanted, President Biden's visit. So I wanted to take uh, from, from uh, your excellent exposition in terms of numbers, right? How numbers talk about the disparities. How do we get from a constitutional framework, such as the insular cases, down to the implementation of federal programs, such as the FEMA, the Stafford Act uh, disaster recovery programs? So how do you go from point A to point B uh, so that people that are listening to us, we have people uh, from Guam, that are listening to us, people from Puerto Rico, uh, people in uh, stateside in the US as well. So thank you very much for, for listening uh, to the panel and for, for seeing the panel. So how do, you, do we get from this uh, judicial framework that does not stem from the constitution, but from a very particular uh, way of interpreting um, the territorial clause and and uh, other dispositions of the constitution to the implementation of federal programs. Is that a question for me or are you yeah. opening it up to? Or open, open to anybody in the panel. Yeah. Just to, to, to point, you know, and, and bring back the, the constitutional conversation or the judicial conversation, we're talking about uh, specific implementation disparities on FEMA. So, how right. are those disparities in implementation related to the uh, disparities yes. expressed in the insular cases? Um, I'll, yeah. I'll just say I'll just say the following. I have uh, it, you know later on in the program I'd like to talk about the federal benefits and how and, and how the insular cases framework affects federal benefits with with relation to Puerto Rico with relation to this disaster. And I'll end right now. Um, I I think it's a great thing. I commend the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights for doing this report. It's the very first time that they did a report like this where they studied uh, the civil rights violations that occurred. And so I'm hoping, and with the report office also of the Department of Homeland Security of the Inspector General, we're hoping that these two reports taken together puts President Biden and his administration to the test in addition to everything that he has expressed about how quoting, almost quoting him, every dollar that is sent to Puerto Rico gets to the people that, that should receive it. But later on in the program, I can talk about the federal benefits and how we see the disparity. Yeah, Arthur Vera, this, this is Brian. Brian Modest. I, I think, with respect to the insular cases and and FEMA and disparities in um, in, in in what's available in benefits, it, it's it's not head on as as with some of the other federal programs. The, the territories do get full participation in the Stafford Act. I think in the case. In this case, in Puerto Rico, it, it was a question of implementation and will. It seems as though that, um, the, the, and, and I'm not trying to be critical of, of my friends at FEMA, but they didn't, they seemingly didn't um, have the, the willingness to be as, as aggressive in, in, in supporting Puerto Rico after Maria. And, and I think th that has been borne out in, in the Civil Rights Commission report. In the case of the Virgin Islands, uh, we also su suffered significant damage from uh, Maria and 
Irma. Um, for us, it, it, it was it was navigating the various rules that that FEMA has for uh, providing disaster assistance, um, mm -hmm. starting with, uh, for example, the cost sharing match. Um, we uh, in our committee um, had introduced legislation uh, last year uh, having to do with climate change. But one of the things that we included in that legislation was to waive the matching requirements for disaster assistance in the territories because uh, all of the, the territories um, uh, from time to time are financially challenged for resources. And when you have to come up with a 20% match or even a 10% match on several billions of dollars, that becomes a, a real challenge for the island. So we, we, uh, we, we, we highlighted that and sign signaled that in our legislation. Hopefully, um, as, as, as the legislation continues to move forward, it's something that we, we can uh, implement either in our bill or in some other forms. Again, in the Virgin Islands, it was it was dealing with the complexities of, of the, the FEMA uh, regulations and requirements, which which con which slowed considerably aid getting to the people in the first instance, and further slowed uh, the long term permanent work being done, like rebuilding our schools and our hospitals. Um, that we are just now starting to get those projects ongoing. So. Uh, hopefully in the next uh, two to three years, we'll, we'll see um, some of those dollars that have been allocated for the Virgin Islands actually um, getting work done. But it's been, it's been a challenge uh, navigating the various um, you know, complexities and requirements that, that are being imposed. And, and as someone who's worked in, in, in the insular areas for these many years, one of the things that we found is that rules that work for the states uh, oftentimes need to be adapted, you know, and mm. differently for the islands because uh, we don't oftentimes have the the, very, the capacity or 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 different um, resources that can be tapped um, like many of the states do. So I think uh, awareness needs to be given um, to that, um, particularly in the area of disaster systems. And of course, in this uh, climate change scenario, uh, Sheila, uh, you have so much experience on, on studying this particular perspective um, on the vulner vulnerability of uh, territories being islands, right? Right. Um, you know, to add on to the FEMA requirements being imposed on our islands, we here have experienced a number of super typhoons in addition to you know the pandemic and many of the uh, impacts of climate change and during the recovery and restoration phase uh, it really came down to the land ownership requirements that uh, FEMA imposed mm -hmm. in order to receive assistance and that was really difficult for our community and challenging because we don't even have street addresses here so it was difficult to find and locate you know, these homes. Um, many of our families live on compounds and have years of probate um, that are not completed or land is passed down through generations orally and that was not acceptable by the federal government. And so you, know, you see a clash and a disconnect between um, the Western requirements and our cultural um, traditions. The fact of the matter is we in the islands, we live on the front lines when it comes to the climate crisis. The climate crisis is happening now. It's not something that's going to happen in the future. And that's something we emphasize as we advocate for our islands. We see our shores disappearing literally before our eyes infrastructure, sidewalks gone, coconut trees gone just in the last five years since I've been home and our coral reefs are dying. Yet we have no say in how the United States is responding to the climate crisis and we have no vote in US Congress. We don't get to vote for president. And last year when I attended the COP26 
um, conference, the United Nations Annual Climate Change Conference in Glasgow, Scotland. It was really my first time to engage on that international platform. And it was something that my community wasn't even used to. We are not engaged in international conversations around climate change because of our relationship with the United States, because of our unique relationship with the United States. And so in Glasgow, Scotland, there were over 60,000 attendees and many from the Pacific Islands, many leaders from the Pacific Islands have been um, attending the COP conferences and we have not. And it was really there where I got to see how our brothers and sisters in Micronesia and in Polynesia and Melanesia, they get to go inside the negotiating rooms. And we stand behind the United States, a country that cannot even point us out on the map. So how can they advocate for us when they don't even know where we, we are? They don't know we exist. And that is the average American after spending time in even um, the state of Hawaii for school, traveling throughout the United States, many of uh, the citizens out there on the continent cannot point us out on a map and don't know we exist. And so it is really important that we advocate for ourselves and we become part of the conversation and we find our, our way in the door and you know, this always brings us back to the insular cases because that really determines our relationship with the United States. Well, exactly, in terms of the policy design as well, as you said, mm -hmm. who designs the policy to be implemented and do territories have a seat in that policy design or not? I'm sorry, uh, Charles, did you wanted to add something? Yes, I'd like to add a little bit uh, to what Brian and Sheila, and particularly in relation to Puerto Rico, as people from the smaller territorial islands, I think we see a bigger bang for the benefits that we get than from Puerto Rico, because Puerto Rico is such a large, has such a large population that its need, its needs are counted up in the billions of dollars when a hurricane hits. And that opens people's eyes. Whereas where, when a hurricane hits one of the smaller islands, we're talking about millions. That's a, you know, that's an accounting, a rounding error, you know, for FEMA. Whereas when Puerto Rico gets hit, that's billions and billions and billions of dollars, which does then raise the eyebrows up there in Congress. So I think the, from what I hear from Brian and from Sheila is kind of the experience we have down here in American Samoa, which is basically that when these uh, FEMA assistance comes in and we've been lucky, we've been able to get FEMA down the day after the hurricane to, or after the tsunami or something like that to, to do their assessments and to get the funds in quickly. And be, But I think what really makes the difference is that out in the territories, the standard of living and the income is much lower than in the US. So what happens is when you get the funds that Americans would say, you're giving me a pittance down here in Samoa, that is, that's a lot of money and people are lined up for it and they're very happy with it. Okay, and that's, you know, because they're, they're, they're getting something that they never would have expected. But Again, the real problem, and so you've got people that are sitting there say, why are people complaining down here in the territories? Why is there this disparity? The disparity comes because the expectations that have been set up and a, a lot to do with the way the insular cases has kind of kept the territories separated and allowed them to be treated differently is what has created this disparity. So that even the expectations of the people down in the territories are always, at least down in American Samoa, is always low. What scares Congress a great deal when Puerto Rico gets hit is that they're going to be looking at 3 million people, right? Not 60,000 people up in, in the Marianas. And I guess there's about 100 in Virgin Islands and 60,000 in Samoa. Those, those are, you know, a small, a small city size. Puerto Rico, no. So this is the, you know, and I think that's the difference between how, uh, how 
how the perception is of what when Puerto Rico asks for money, it's not going to be a small amount in terms of the budget. It'll make a big impact on the budget. Whereas when the other islands get hit, it's not as big a a, a hit. And I, would add, I would add to that just quickly. I, I think it's um, unfortunate that um, it's taken storms and disasters like Hurricane Irma, Maria, uh, some of the disasters that have impacted other territories to even raise awareness that the people in these areas exist to the rest of the United States. Uh, mm -hmm. I've been working on these issues in my nonprofit now for almost a decade. And there's, uh, there's a, just a stark dividing line in national attention before and after Hurricane Maria. So that's a silver lining of sorts, but it just speaks to the level of marginalization that it takes something as destructive as uh, uh, a category five hurricane killing thousands of people um, to even get the attention that uh, Puerto Rico is part of the United States or that these areas uh, have US citizens and that the federal government has a responsibility to act in these areas. So that's kind of one sad thing that's... Uh, and Neil, Neil, to add to that, unfortunately, the previous administration took the view that Puerto Rico didn't deserve that level of funding and, and, and slow walked the funding that, that Congress allocated. So mm -hmm. you, you added that to the mix as well. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So, so, so we see that the Supreme Court during that era, 1901, 1922, it's been 100 years since the last important case, uh, framed a doctrine without, of course, without guidelines for implementation. Uh, how are you going to interpret that disparity uh, and the, the powers between Congress and the Supreme Court in interpreting uh, the, 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 uh, that framework uh, established in those cases. So of course you're gonna see the disparities and you're gonna see them uh, in, the, in the worst case scenarios, uh, it, like disasters and uh, disaster relief. So, Going back to, to the issue on the jurisprudence and the, and the, and the insular cases, it, right? we have a momentum, sort of a momentum growing uh, in terms of uh, a lot of cases, uh, more than we've seen uh, in the past decades, uh, going uh, into the consideration of the Supreme Court that have to do uh, either directly or indirectly with the insular cases. Some of them, such as the Fitisamanu case, uh, which will be in conference next week uh, for the consideration of the Supreme Court, uh, have to do directly with, with an ask for revoking the, the insular cases. So uh, in terms of, of the case, the status of the Fitisamanu case, the expectations uh, of the case, uh, and the implications uh, if the Supreme Court determines to revoke or not to revoke uh, Charles, can you talk, you're, you being one of the co-counsels of the case, can you talk a bit about uh, what we are to expect and the implications of, of the case that we're gonna be uh, seeing? Uh, thank you. Um, the situation right now, obviously, is basically we're asking the Supreme Court to take up review of this issue of birthright citizenship of the 14th Amendment under the 14th Amendment. And obviously, the, our, our arguments are that the insular cases did not deal specifically with the issue of citizenship. They were just sort of tangentially uh, certain dicta or what we would consider dicta were used as a justification for denying birthright citizenship to those ter to the territories that had come under U.S. sovereignty. So basically, we are, uh, the, the, the issues that are coming up to the Supreme Court have not, do not deal with the taxing authority of the United States or the Benef the, the monetary benefits to the territories that the other cases seem to have been com coming up. What kind of, you know, we're not, we're getting different benefits from the U.S. at the other territories as 
that the other territories are complaining about. We're citizens, but we're getting different benefits and the insular cases are harming us in that uh, because of that. American Samoa is basically saying, no, we're not even, we're not dealing here with issues of monetary benefits for citizens. We're dealing with the underlying issue of citizenship that the insular cases have been, uh, have insinuated itself upon to change basically the 14th, uh, you know, to change the, the, the Wong Kim Ark decision, basically, to say that you're not a citizen if you're born in these territories. And that is why uh, we are taking the the effort to uh, to bring this up. So that kind of makes a distinction because I think a lot of what the uh, the, the other cases regarding the solar cases are basically people of the territory who have already been given citizenship by Congress are saying, hey, we're citizens. Why are we being treated differently? We are saying we are citizens. We're not, I mean, we are citizens from the get-go. So, you know, we have to get to that first step of getting the citizenship and we're trying to get it by uh, by constitutional authority, not by congressional authority, because we're saying congressional authority does not apply to this kind of uh, situation. Now, how will it affect the people down here? And this is where it's just so interesting down here to see how people are reacting to this. I think in the initially, in hi historically, the Samoans thought when they gave sovereign the Samoans and American Samoa who gave the chiefs who gave sovereignty to the United States thought, hey, we're citizens. And then suddenly America came back and says, oh, I'm sorry, you're not citizens. Uh, they in fact sent a congressional delegation down here to say, okay, are we going to give you congressional citizenship? Uh, in the, in the, in the 20s, they came back down here and they said, a uh, congressional committee came down, a Senate committee came down and said, and the Samoans came out, the chiefs came out and said, no, we want, we thought we were citizens. They went back and asked Congress to make Samoans citizens, but it was denied in the House of Representatives. Now, and they create, and then they started to create this whole national uh, uh, type of uh, second class national citizenship to basically to cover American Samoa, you know, the, those people that were not given congressional citizenship. Again, they would, and the courts were allowing this to happen under the rubric of the, under the insular cases. Now, in terms of the concerns down here about what do you do if you get citizenship, there's really nothing that's going to affect uh, being a citizen is not going to affect the culture in any way. There, nobody has been able to actually point out to me what is the difference. Down here in American Samoa, I would say about maybe 20% of the Samoans that live here are U.S. citizens. I'm a U.S. citizen. Uh, the, our congresswoman is a U.S. citizen. Uh, and I've always asked them, is your culture and your traditions and your rights to land affected by the fact that you're a citizen and the and the person that was born next to me, not a citizen, and is a national? Uh, and the answer is they couldn't think of anything. They could not think of any any specific issue that you know that citizenship would affect with respect to their custom and culture. They just had this general kind of thinking. Oh well, we don't want to become like the Hawaiians. We're not going to. We don't want to become like the, or that we're re, we're unique. Our customs and culture is unique among all the entire world. You know, all the other cust cultures in in America. We're somehow unique. I say, how are we unique from from Guam or 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 Puerto Rico and their history and and uh, up there in the Marianas or Hawaii or the, with the Hawaiian movement? I said, no, the citizenship has nothing to do with that. And I would say that if citizenship is granted here, the next day, everybody will just go about, okay, we're citizens, you know, and nobody's going to, nothing will change. Again, it's, a, it's, an, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, uh, thing that uh, we, need to, we need to deal with. Now, I'll, I'll let Neil go further on the nuts and bolts of the of the uh, constitutional arguments that we're going to be making because he's up there and has, has the better connection to all those uh, white tower people in the <laughs> who can give a much better rendition of the constitutional issues. I can just give the the background on what would happen down here if citizenship is granted. Hey, Neil, yeah. this, this is this is this is Brian before you jump in. 
That's an interesting point that Charles made about citizenship not changing anything. What uh, impact would the fact that American Samoa is both a territory but an unincorporated territory, I mean, but a, yeah, uh, uh, unorganized territories, meaning that they're not, you know, they don't have an organic act the way the rest of us do. Does that play into that issue as well? Is that something that, uh, that, that could uh, temper the concerns that we hear from some of the leaders in American Samoa that if they were granted citizenship, they, that, well, that would be the basis by which they would um, lose their cultural um, history, practice, I mean. Well, I, yeah, I, I look at that and I spent 40 years here arguing in front of this court, trying to protect communal land, trying to protect the titles and handling title cases and, and things of that sort with chiefs. And I've been doing this under this, you know, under its existing constitutional structure. Its constitutional structure was created in 1961 by the Secretary of Interior under their authority to do the, to administer the islands. They created a constitution. And the reason it was created in 1961 is because the U.S. government was watching the neighboring Western Samoa become independent with its constitution. So they wanted to show the United Nations, right? And the American Samoans did not want to join Western Samoa. They were asked, and they absolutely said, no, we want to still be part of the United States. So as part of this sort of uh, anti-colonial movement that the U.S. was trying to, to, to prop up, but they couldn't do that if, they, you know, if they had their own colony, they created a constitution for American Samoa within the federal structure, right? And they've been operating under that constitution uh, since that time. So the idea that says you're not an organized territory doesn't make much sense. What do you mean by organized territory? Meaning, and, and Congress has now backdoored approved this constitution back in 84, when they told the Secretary of Interior, you cannot change the constitution that you have already taken into, uh, that you've already approved for American Samoa, because uh, the Secretary of Interior was getting kind of irritated at the Attorney General and who was not prosecuting cases. So he said, okay, I'm going to exercise my author plenary authority and, and remove the AG, even though he was appointed under the, by the governor under the Constitution, under his Constitution. They, they actually put something in a bill in Congress which said, do not interfere with the you know, constitutional authority of the of the governor, which basically backdoored this this existing constitution into an organized territory. Basically, we're an organized territory because only Congress can now change our constitution, which is the same as every other, you know, as except, which is the same as every every other territory. So I, we 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 don't have a constitution in the Virgin Islands, by the way. We have okay, well, I don't know. About, uh, but, uh, okay, yeah, yeah, so but, yeah, I you have. I think that this issue on citizenship um, is ver varies uh, and the complexities varies uh, from territory to territory. Uh, but I do think that there is a common uh, ground regarding self-determination. Um, and of course, the constitutional issue of not having a constitution that Brian just pointed out uh, for me relates to that uh, area as well. We're gonna be talking a little bit more about uh, the issues of self-determination uh, when we talk about racial justice. Um, but for now, uh, going back maybe to, to the uh, ask included in the Fitisamanu case of uh, overruling the insular cases, uh, Neil, why do you think it is important uh, for these, uh, this, the insular cases, uh, insular cases doctrine to be overruled? Thank you, Atavera. And I think the answer to this question goes back to the question you asked at uh, the first part of this discussion about what's the connection between the insular cases and things like FEMA's response in Puerto Rico or other discrimination against residents of US territories. And it's the fact that uh, the insular cases have created what uh, Justice Gorsuch recently called uh, a rotten foundation. Um, Justice Sotomayor labeled the insular cases reasoning as odious and wrong, the title of this conversation today. And 
the fact is the insular cases established this colonial framework um, that distinguished jurists like uh, uh, former uh, uh, Judge Juan Torella labeled as a doctrine of separate and unequal. And it's the status of uh, constitutionalized marginalization uh, of having uh, a, a defined legal framework that treats uh, residents of the territories as an other, as a less than, uh, uh, that authorizes both on the face of the doctrine itself, but even perhaps more insidiously, um, just in what these cases stand for, that it's okay to neglect uh, these areas. It's okay to not treat them the same as other residents and other communities in the United States. Um, and that's kind of the most direct, you know, insidious impact. Uh, more doctrinally and, and kind of policy oriented, the insert cases uh, were a dramatic departure from the way the Supreme Court and the federal government approached U.S. territories in the first place. So the United States has always had territories from the very beginning. The Northwest Territories uh, were uh, enacted uh, as one of the first laws after the Constitution was ratified. Um, and these areas were always understood as being uh, temporary, that as soon as the population could govern itself, they would be on a path to statehood, or, or Congress also had the power to dispose of these areas and, and have them become independent. Um, but with the insert cases, you had this question after the Spanish-American War, when the United States decided to acquire sovereignty over these far-flung islands that had large populations of people with, who spoke a different language, had a different culture, had different legal history and, and had different skin color. And the racism of the time period um, meant that the United States wanted to keep these areas as colonies, um, but didn't want to extend the same rights uh, to democratic participation, to equality under the US flag, um, to the millions of people who lived in these areas. Um, and that's, that stark departure is what led to the decisions in the insert cases where essentially the Supreme Court ruled that it's okay for the United States to have colonies. Mm -hmm. And the court's jurisprudence, you know, recognized this explicitly uh, in some of the ways that, it, that impact the territories. And the other doctrinal impact, of course, is uh, this idea that the constitution doesn't apply quote in full, whatever, you know, that's supposed to mean. In practice, it's meant uh, the denial of a range of rights from a right to birthright citizenship, um, not just in America and Samoa, but in each of the territories at different points in time. Uh, court cases that have uh, denied uh, uh, the Fourth Amendment's protection of search and seizure in the Virgin Islands, the Baxter case that came down a few years ago. Um, and in its place, uh, you have uh, these lower courts establishing this doctrine under the, under the insert cases framework where uh, only so-called fundamental rights apply in the territories. And their, their definition of that is extremely narrow, um, looking at uh, only such rights that the principles are the basis of all free government. Again, whatever that means, um, but certainly it means that many of the rights that uh, U.S. communities take for granted if Congress so chose, uh, might not apply in the territories and that this kind of sort of Damocles hangs over um, citizens of each of the territories that, well, what happens if Congress changes its mind and decides to restrict certain rights or deny citizenship? Um, this is quite troubling. Um, and then the other thing that makes overruling the insert cases so critical, if you look at uh, the history of the Supreme Court in, in engaging on issues of civil rights and, and justice, um, the insert cases were, uh, were decided upon by the same Supreme Court that decided Plessy versus Ferguson, which uh, established the framework of a separate but equal that justified racial discrimination in this country. Plessy versus Ferguson has long been overruled with Brown v. Board of Education in the 1950s, mm -hmm. saying that that's not who we were as a country and that's not consistent with our constitution. Following the court overruling Plessy and Brown, um, that decision served as a catalyst for political change. The Congress and the president took on issues of civil rights and racial discrimination in ways that this country never had before, uh, following overruling Plessy with passing laws such as the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act of the 1960s. 
And our hope is that that same kind of cat catalyst and change could uh, be created by this court taking responsibility for the problem it itself created. Um, the Supreme Court created the insert cases out of whole cloth and this, this doctrine of separate and unequal. And so it has a responsibility to address that issue, to encourage the political branches to act in ways they have not before when it comes to discrimination in federal benefits programs, when it comes to questions of self-determination, when it comes to questions about militarization or uh, environmental uh, issues. Uh, as it stands now, Congress, many members of Congress feel like the insert cases are an excuse not to act, that it's okay to treat these areas differently. It's okay to ignore them. And as long as that continues to stand, I believe we're gonna continue to have challenges addressing these issues in Congress. And those are just some of the reasons why it's time the Supreme Court finally turns the page on the insert cases as several justices from Sotomayor on the left to Gorsuch on the right seem intent to do. And if we had forgotten uh, about the importance of, or the impact that Supreme Court uh, opinions have on society, we have a recent example of a decision overruled recently uh, in the Dobbs case the, on the issue of abortion. So, so we know that uh, determinations by the Supreme Court do have a great political, cultural, uh, even economic impact on, on the lives of people. So um, in terms of uh, the importance related uh, to the territories, I would like to take advantage of the fact that uh, we have um, here all the voices from all the territories. Uh, so Leah, can you share a bit about why it is so important this case that has nothing to do uh, in terms of the of the facts of the case it has nothing to do with puerto rico but why it is so important uh, for puerto rico yes absolutely so the we support the fisita mano case uh, we uh, joined a, an amicus brief that was drafted by the aclu on the issue of overruling the insular cases um, I'm just going to talk about one of the areas in which the insular cases impacts real people and impacts the lives of Puerto Ricans that live on the island. So, because um, there's many different effects, but at least one of them that I want to focus on just very briefly is federal benefits. And I'm sure that uh, my colleagues here and are also thinking about their own uh, territories that they come from, and it's the same story everywhere. I, I also want to point out before I even mention that um, something that happens is that federal benefits are afforded or denied even differently to the different territories. And, and other statutes are also applied differently to the different territories, including the Merchant Marine Act, which is also known as the Jones Act of 1920, doesn't apply to all of the territories the same. And there are other statutes that also are not applied equally. So it's just something that really is kind of mind boggling. But in terms of Puerto Rico, I would like to say the following because Puerto Rico has such a high poverty rate that just the fact that um, federal benefits are afforded differently to residents of Puerto Rico is, is abominable. So for example, just very briefly, we talk about food insecurity um, when we talk about, for example, the SNAP program, which is a supplemental nutritional assistance program. So American citizens that live in Puerto Rico do not qualify for SNAP. Um, in Puerto Rico, there's a different program known as NAP, right? Nutritional Assistance Program that provides food to, us, to needy households. But it wasn't always that way because Puerto Rico used to participate in SNAP. Um, it used to be called the Food Stamps Program. And um, it participated just like residents of the 50 states, the District of Columbia, Guam, and the Virgin Islands until the Reagan administration. And President Reagan decided and Congress at the time decided that they were going to take Puerto Rico out of the SNAP program and they replaced the food stamp program of Puerto Rico with a block grant that became, that became the NAP program. And um, with funding levels way below what SNAP uh, provides, right? Mm -hmm. And at the time when this happened, Puerto Rico was the only region, was the only state or territory that was singled out and was taken out of SNAP at that time. Um, I want to mention that American Samoa and the Northern Mariana Islands also re received nutritional 
assistance block grants and they do not have SNAP either. So, um, you know, SNAP is a much better program. It's funded with federal dollars. It does, uh, it's not capped. A uh, NAP is a is a capped block grant, so that means that Puerto Rico receives a certain amount of money for NAP, and um, the implementation is is quite different. So SNAP will serve all of the applicants who are eligible, and it's based on poverty levels. And anybody who's eligible can will receive benefits, and it's consistent and based on the cost of food, et cetera. But in Puerto Rico, NAP, because of the capped funding, that forces the eligibility to be based on the budget that, that they have. So a lot less people are able to qualify for the benefit, and they cannot necessarily serve all of the residents that need it. Whereas um, there would be a large amount of a larger amount of individuals who could benefit from nutritional assistance under SNAP. So that's one. The other, I mean, I'm still kind of like drying my eyes with respect to the case of um, United States v. Vallejo Madero. I mean, that's just so devastating that I'm, I still haven't recovered completely uh, regarding that case. But again, the double constitutional standard that's created in the insular cases provides a lower level of benefits to people um, with respect to social security disability insurance. And in Vallejo Madero, as we, uh, most of us already know, the Supreme Court rejected the view that um, it was a violation to deny the residents of Puerto Rico um, supplemental security insurance or SSI, as long as Congress had a rational basis to do so. Because um, the majority opinion offered by Justice Kavanaugh, uh, they decided that, uh, you know, the territorial clause of the Constitution that provides plenary powers to Congress over all of the territories um, suffices and that Congress had a rational basis to deny this benefit because allegedly Puerto Rico doesn't pay enough federal taxes, which is not really true. And I would, you know, invite anybody to read Justice Sotomayor's dissent. She explains it in a lot of detail that I won't go into right now. Um, but I, I do wanna just really, really emphasize that SSI is a needs-based program. It's for the neediest of people. It's for those people that cannot work because they are disabled, they are blind, or they are elderly, and they definitely are poor. So you know, this decision denies help to the neediest of American citizens. And I, I wanna point out some statistics very, just very briefly. Um, as you can see, I'm big on statistics, but just very briefly. So according to the census, that's updated every year in the um, community survey. So updated on July 1st of 2021, in Puerto Rico, the percent of people with a disability under the age of 65, so not even, not even talking about the elderly, disabled individuals under the age of 65 is 14.8%, that's 15%. And considering the total population of Puerto Rico, um, that would amount to almost half a million people. That amounts to 483,000 people under the age of 65 in Puerto Rico who are disabled. And many of them um, are definitely poor considering Puerto Rico's poverty level of 40.5%. And these individuals um, are denied SSI. And then the last program that I'll just mention for now um, that also just demonstrates uh, the, the unequal treatment of Puerto Rico and other territories is, is Medicaid. Like right now, there's a Medicaid funding crisis that's slated to hit in December. Um, the Consolidated Appropriations Act had increased the contributions to the Medicaid program in Puerto Rico, as well as Guam and the U.S. Virgin Islands and the Northern Mariana Islands, and I believe all of us and American Samoa, um, there was an increase until December 13 of 2022, but without congressional action, which has not happened, that rate will go down and it will revert to the 55% that the United States contributes to Medicaid, which means that the government of Puerto Rico has to contribute 45% to fund the health insurance, uh, the public health insurance program for most of the, of the people in, in Puerto Rico. So the fact that the territory's matching rate is arbitrarily capped at 55%, um, even though the average per capita income is, is below the average per capita income of, of residents of most of the United States, um, also just demonstrates the, the inequality. And, and yesterday there was a press conference in Puerto Rico um, attended by a representation from all of the different medical fields and health providers and hospitals, et cetera, where resident commissioner Jennifer Gonzalez informed that the United States medium contribution to um, in Puerto Rico to Medicaid funding for Puerto Rico 
Um, the median contribution is $2,142 a year per patient, whereas in the United States, the contribution is $8,486 a year per patient to anyone that needs it in the United States. And that is absolutely abominable um, in, a, in a territory where the median household income is $21,058, according to the US Census, where the per capita income is $13,318. And the percent of people living in poverty in Puerto Rico is 40.5%. So it's an insult and it's, um, I, I have no, I don't have enough adjectives to describe what this is like. And this is, this is Puerto Rico, but this happens in all of the territories. We all have our different programs that apply or don't apply, but it, it's, it's just like, you can see how I feel about this where, you know, the United States in so many ways um, throws, you know, crumbs to the territories in certain ways and, funds certain programs, but then doesn't fund other programs or gives us a lesser amount of benefits um, than the ones that are received in the mainland United States. And that is based on the framework of the insular cases that says that, you know, because of the artificial territorial incorporation doctrine that the Supreme Court created, unincorporated territories, which happens to be all of us, just because, you know, Congress decided and people decided that these five countries that are here, we are all unincorporated territories and that we are only afforded fundamental uh, constitutional rights and that we can be treated differently than the residents of the mainland United States or the 50 states of the union. So uh, de uh, departing from that, uh, Brian, yes. in terms of congressional action, HR 279, uh, talk to us a little bit about that. The, the resolution, HRES, yes. HRES two, two, uh, 279. Um, I, I will in a second. Uh, um, uh, Leah's presentation was, was so spot on in many aspects. And, and one of the things that I, that I will say is that you mentioned the uh, American Community Survey. The other territories don't get the benefit of that. And, and it's one of the things that I've been, we've been trying to, to get rectified. And um, we, in fact, uh, have introduced legislation to, to not only just have those, uh, that information collected in, in the smaller territories, but all of the other surveys that are not collected. Because when no, that information isn't collected, we don't have the benefit of knowing the percentage of seniors that are in that are disabled. Um, so it's, it's, it's these kinds of things. Um, the resolution, uh, you know, we, Chairman Grijalva and uh, Ms. Uh, Delegate Plaskett, uh, Resident Commissioner Jennifer Gonzalez, uh, and Mr. Sablon, and Chuy Garcia, and, and Nadia Velasquez, and, and Richie Torres introduced it, and they were later joined by, I believe, another nine members for a total of six, 16 co-sponsors, because they, they felt it was important building on the work that Neil had been doing in the courts to highlight the, the, the fact that the insular cases is still law and, and it's still precedent by the Supreme Court and that Congress should re reject it. We, uh, we held a hearing on it uh, and had witnesses from all of the territories, including Neil. And it, it was, a, it was a, uh, an eye-opening hearing. It was, it was the first of its kind since I've been in in Congress, um, and it pointed out, you know, uh, why it, it's such an odious doctrine that needs to to, to go away. Um, we have been trying since the hearing to have the resolution be brought up on the on the floor of the House for a vote. For technical reasons, it's it's more difficult to have resolutions brought up rather than a bill itself. Um, but nonetheless. We've been trying, and of late, uh, Chairman Grijalva and all the other chairmen have petitioned the speaker and the majority leader to uh, allow us to you know, come to the floor later in the fall. Um, I, I must say that we had lost some momentum at the end of the summer because our resolution was both jointly referred to our committee, the Natural Resources Committee, which handles territories, as well as the Judiciary Committee, which handles the courts. 
and the chairman of the Judiciary Committee was going through a, a difficult primary. And so we weren't able to get them to respond to our request to ask us to move, to ask them to waive their jurisdiction so we, we could go to the floor. That primary is over. And so I'm hopeful that before the end of this year, um, the, the speaker and the majority leader would allow us to have floor time to debate this resolution and, and have the House of Representatives go on record as saying that uh, we believe that the insta cases should be repudiated. And, and that's, that's our resolution. Thank you. And I think Aliyah exposed in numbers, uh, you know, the reality of the impl in implementation of uh, some programs and the, the, the lack of participation in policy design and its effects on, on the population in times of, of great need. So um, departing from that or, or taking that point uh, and developing it even more, um, I just want to say that we have a lot of people uh, joining us. We have people from the U.S. Virgin Islands. So Brian, you have uh, your, your, your people from the Virgin <laughs> Islands here with us, uh, from Guam as well, um, and from Puerto Rico. I have a couple of fans, of Leah fans, uh, that have uh, made uh, great comments about Leah. We'll share those with you <laughs> after the panel. Um, I'm a Leah fan. <laughs> yeah, we're all I think Leah. we all are. We all are. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yes, so we also have questions that uh, the people have been sending us, and I wanted uh, at the end of the panel to take some time to address some of those, which are pretty good, uh, pretty good questions. So I wanted to ask the panel if we could uh, now uh, turn to the issue on racial justice, uh, because I think uh, this is, you know, Neil uh, spoke about this earlier on uh, the insular cases being the, the Plessy, right? Uh, similar to Plessy um, in terms of uh, racial discrimination. Uh, so, so talking about race, and if we could also talk about uh, inequality and marginalization, okay? And, and bring those uh, three areas together in our discussion. Uh, so who wants to start talking about uh, the issue of racism and white supremacy that Neil introduced earlier. Well, I guess I can start down here in American Samoa about the uh, the the racism and how it's how it affects how we do things down here. American Samoan the Samoan culture basically is an inclusive culture. It does look at blood, but it looks at blood as a way to include you. So whatever your percentage of blood is, as long as you can show that you have an ancestry into a family, you have a right to come into the family. The big arguments are, well, your history is wrong and you're not part of the family. But once you've established that you are part of the family, you, know, you are included no matter who you are. So the idea of looking for race and blood in the Psalm 1 setting, and in, I think in most communal settings, is it, it's, it, it's an attempt to include more and more people. And if some people aren't included, well, we'll adopt them, you know. I mean, and that's, I mean, if Bill Gates came in and said, I want to be Psalm 1, I'll adopt him in a minute, you know. And that's, you know, that, that's what it is. It's inclusive. The American concept and history of race has been exclusive. Uh -huh. If you have a drop of something in you that's not this blood, you are excluded from the in-group. And that's the difference when people come down here and say, you know, and the, it, it, when people come down, well, Samoans look at blood too, but it's to include. And we do not try to exclude you because you happen to have a blood of somebody else in your, in your system. Mm -hmm. So I think in, in, in terms of the, 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 the racial ideas that were present at the time the insular cases were, were founded, it was based upon the American concept of race as being, you know, as being an exclusive thing. And they did it to Samoans. They said to the Samoans, if you are two-thirds Samoan, then you are a Samoan, okay? 
for purposes of land ownership. And they, they convinced the Samoans that that was going to, American Samoans, that that was how it should be. And so now we have down here, we have this racial uh, system that says, you know, they had to reduce it to 50% blood because somebody found out that, oh God, my kids are all now going to be excluded because I married uh, uh, somebody from outside. Well, they're going to have to reduce it down to 25% because I'm dealing with cases now where, you know, uh, we're now down to 25%. But I'm trying to get rid of the thing altogether. Uh, just basically tell the, the judges this is, and it is, it is, I knock my head, I bring it up three times in front of the courts here in American Samoa to try to say, no, these, these racially exclusive laws are based upon this system that was created by the exclusionary ideas that were present in the, you know, that the insular cases basically, uh, uh, that, that basically start, which basically says you are excluded if you're not, so when we treat race, the Americans were applying their idea of race down to Samoans, saying you're a race, and so to protect you, you know, only people of certain blood percentages like we do in America will be able to get that treatment. That's the legacy of these insular cases that is had here in American Samoa, and it still exists. It's got to get stopped. It's got to say, no, we no longer accept that exclusiveness that you have where your concepts of blood are exclusive, not inclusive. Okay, so that's the, and that's the issue I think that underpins a lot of this racial disharmony that we see is this distinction between how Americans perceive blood and how we in, you know, in Samoa, and I'm sure in all the other places perceive blood. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sheila, uh... Do you, you have, of course, expertise in the issue around uh, indigenous rights uh, and self-determination. How do you uh, uh, connect uh, the, the, the theme on, on racial justice and the, the, the history of racism and white supremacy be, behind the insular cases and uh, the, the complexity of the indigenous rights issues and self-determination. And I just first say like, wow, Charles, I am blown away. What a shift in perspective because we um, are experiencing the same thing here in the Northern Marianas. Um, the indigenous rights conversation, the movement is really centered around land ownership and control over our natural resources. Um, here in the Northern Marianas, we have the beloved and highly controversial Article 12 that limits land ownership to those of Northern Marianas descent. And it used, we used to have a blood quantum and we changed that to now uh, state to a certain degree. And so, you know, it just hearing what you've shared around shifting your perspective on exclusivity versus inclusivity um, can really help support the conversation around the insular cases because here in the Northern Marianas, we don't uh, talk about the insular cases. The average citizen here, um, will not really know uh, what you're talking about. But when you bring up land rights, bless you. When you bring up land <laughs> rights, land ownership, uh, um, you know, that is what's important to our community. It's because of things like you stated earlier, you know, looking at Guam or Hawaii as an example of what where we don't want to end up. And, and so, you know, that fear is very real. And I think that the insular cases really because of the weak foundation, it just perpetuates that fear in our community of what we stand to lose. And, and so, you know, we try to have conversations like this 
where we can just start talking about it because uh, what we know now is the relationship between us and the United States, it can become better. You know, it's not working for us now. Um, even though, like you stated earlier, you know, the federal aid that comes into the Marianas because we're around 50,000 people, it is a huge uh, help, but that just continues to make us reliant and dependent on the United States. And so what kind of path to self-determination and sovereignty are we looking at and how long? Because this dependent relationship is not healthy for us. And uh, we often hear the, the phrase, don't bite the hand that feeds you. And I just want us to start feeding ourselves. <laughs> Vera, I, I think on, on the question of, of race and and, um, you know, and discrimination, which is founded in the insular cases, I think the point that Neil made earlier was an excellent one, where he said that the, the repeal of Plessy v. Ferguson and, and the Brown decision kind of catapulted other progressive legislation dealing with discrimination and race. And, and so similarly, if, if we get rid of the insular cases, we get rid of that doctrine, I think they, that, that underpinning for this district uh, treatment will, will go away in a similar manner. So I, I thought that was, that was an important point. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sheila, and thank you, Brian. Um, Leah or Neil, do you have available uh, the specific phrases that uh, were used in that uh, Downs versus Bidwell opinion that depict this uh, racist uh, framework uh, that was used to to build this doctrine of the insular cases. Um, so yeah, I could, I could jump in. If that's okay. Specific words. Yeah, sure. Let me jump in, and um, I mean. Neil will probably have more specific words, but I do have that in, in Downs, the court uh, described residents of the territories. And in that case, it was residents of Puerto Rico because Downs had to do with Puerto Rico as alien races and savage tribes. Um, you know, the court clearly considered the residents of Puerto Rico and the territories as racially inferior. I, I wanted to point out as well, um, although Neil did mention that, that, that um, the court that decided the earlier of the insular cases is the same court that decided Plessy. Well, Justice Henry Billings Brown wrote the majority opinions in both uh, Plessy v. Ferguson as well as in Downs. And I just wanted to quote him in, in Plessy, for instance, Justice Brown wrote for the eight to one majority. And I quote, if one race be inferior to the other socially, the constitution of the United States cannot put them upon the same plane. And of course, you know, the court 60 years later overruled Plessy. But then you have these cases that describe the residents of the territories as savages and alien races and, and other things as well that perhaps um, Neil has the other quotes. And just like there was a separate but equal doctrine that was created um, after, you know, the decision in Plessy, currently we have a separate but equal doctrine for the residents of the U.S. territories, which is yep. created and sustained by the insular cases. It's the same thing. I mean, I don't want to say it's the same thing. Please don't uh, misunderstand me. The times were different and the struggles of African-Americans and the struggles today might be somewhat different. I'm not saying that they are identical, but the concept of holding races as inferior, which was legitimized in Plessy as the separate but equal doctrine and gave rise to the Jim Crow era, is the same that we have currently with the insular cases and the residents of the territories. And that is intolerable. And, and so we have this court, this current court is being asked directly because they've skirted it. They skirted it in Aurelius Investment. They skirted it in Vallejo Madero. They, they skirted addressing the matter directly because allegedly the parties had not squarely asked them to overrule the insular cases. Well, we have the case of Fisi Semanu and, and the question is asked directly to overrule the insular cases. Let's hope that they take up this case and that they can finally, you know, really demonstrate, well, are they going to sustain separate but equal? 
to the residents of the territories or will they overrule the insular cases and at least in terms of case law sustain equality we know that that's not going to solve all of the problems of the territories but at least it would be a good step uh, forward in that direction. Yeah, and as Leah said, I mean, reading Downs versus Bidwell and these other uh, insular cases really just turns the stomach. Um, the language they use to describe the people of Puerto Rico, the people of other territories, um, calling them unfit to be citizens, um, saying that they shouldn't be allowed to exercise uh, the right to vote, um, and, and really just seg separating them um, from this history of the United States and territories where um, these areas were included uh, uh, in the future of the country and in this political participation. And then e equally, if not even more stomach turning is if you read um, the congressional record from the time period talking about issues of citizenship in Puerto Rico were in um, American Samoa and the opposition and what ended up defeating um, the requests of American Samoans to be recognized as citizens in the 1920s and 30s and even through the 40s and beyond um, was statements of members of the House of Representatives uh, that similarly labeled them as racial inferiors, uh, unable to uh, govern themselves, uh, unfit to uh, have uh, the label of citizen uh, given to them. And so it's from the foundation, and this is the rotten foundation that Justice Gorsuch talked about, uh, these racial stereotypes that this was grounded in has continued on to the present day where um, had the response to Hurricane Maria happened in any other community in the United States uh, with the federal government not providing a response, you know, with thousands of people dying after the storm had long uh, left the islands, um, it would have been a national scandal. I mean, it, it was something that got a lot of attention, um, but not the way it would have had it happened in um, in Iowa or in you know some other uh, state with different demographics in Puerto Rico. And so, this question of race and racism, I think, is uh, can't be. Uh, can't, can't be separated from both the roots of uh, discrimination against residents of the territories and where that exists today. And it's nice to see justices from across the ideological spectrum from Justice Sotomayor to Justice Gorsuch such recognizing that. Um, and the hope is uh, that the Supreme Court will take up this issue when they consider Fede Simonio versus United States next week. Um, and that it'll provide an opportunity for the, the that is long overdue um, for the United States Supreme Court and the United States as a whole to grapple with this colonial legacy and turn the page on the insular cases and the racist colonial framework they established. Definitely. So uh, does the panel agree uh, that we can take on some questions from our public so that we have the opportunity right. to, to address them? Okay, so I'm going to open my cell phone. I've been getting text messages also from uh, friends that are that are listening to to the panel, and everybody is very very happy. I think uh, one of the things that I learned um, talking to each one of you before the panel is that it is so important uh, for us territories to have this conversation between territories so that we can uh, see each other reflected um, and, and learn from the experiences and, and the history of each one of the territories, uh, but also uh, learn that we have a common, a common cause, a common ground uh, to, to take action and to, to educate even more. Um, okay, so I have a question from Dylan Schaefer from Colorado. Um, so he asks, when the insular cases are overturned, what will be the new status of each new territory? He asks in terms of uh, citizenship, in terms of voting rights, uh, and in terms of statehood. Okay, I'll jump in first. <laughs> 
Well, the insular cases is not going to take care of everything. Obviously, just like, you know, overruling Plessy v. Ferguson did not take care of racism. It, it advanced uh, uh, civil rights in many ways, and it was a great step forward. And that's going to happen with the insular cases as well. The most important thing, at least from my perspective, for us to remember is that once the insular cases are overruled, the federal government will no longer be able to rely on them to justify discriminatory treatment against the territories. We will still have the territorial clause of the Constitution, and we will still have other avenues of arguments for the government, but they will not be able to rely on that one, and it will be much more difficult to justify treating the territories differently. With respect to statehood and status, um, those issues uh, relate directly to self-determination. I believe that perhaps we can have another webinar that I think would be really interesting and fascinated to, fascinating to have, where each of the territories is, is obviously, you know, entitled and, and empowered to make their own decision. And I don't think that right now um, that's necessarily the topic to be discussed currently. But the insular cases per se is not going to affect the political status of any of the territories. Thank you. Anybody else wants to add uh, to what Leah responded? Okay, no, so, oh, sorry. Well, she's correct in, in what she said. In, in terms of statehood specifically, it, it, it takes an act of Congress to admit a territory to be a state, so it wouldn't happen automatically. Okay, so I we would, have another, sorry. Go ahead. go ahead, Nana, go ahead. We have another question. This time from Maritere Padilla. Um, I know her. Hello, Maritere. Uh, she works uh, in Hispanic in the Hispanic Federation. She's from Puerto Rico. So uh, she asks uh, in terms of regarding the Puerto Rico relationship to the U.S. Should Congress have discretion to discriminate against the U.S. citizens that live in Puerto Rico and their human dignity? Should Congress have the discretion to discriminate against poor, disabled, elderly, blind people that live in Puerto Rico, as it was decided in Bayo Madero? Should congressional power be limited by human dignity and inherent, inherent human rights? Absolutely not. Congress should not have the discretion. It should not have the discretion, but it does because of the territorial clause of the Constitution. And currently, because of the insular cases that support a lot of the government's arguments as defective as they are. So no, Congress should not. Unfortunately, it does in many situations. And I, I just want to insert here, this is something that I've shared with Neil a while back. You know, I am the, dis I am the sister of a disabled man in Puerto Rico. When the Valle Madero decision came out, I couldn't continue working that day. I was so affected. Um, I felt personally insulted as a Puerto Rican. And also as someone with a disabled family member, I could only imagine um, how devastating this was for so many people. Fortunately, my brother has what he needs, but so many people really rely and, and need assistance. So yeah, it's, it's, it's abominable. And I know Maritere as well, and I know where her heart is, and I know where the hearts of so many of my compatriotas and so many people from the territories, from the other territories are. And all of these um, results are extremely unjust. No, they should not be happening. And that's why we're hoping that um, this is a, a step forward if the Supreme Court overrules the insular cases. A lot more work will need to be done, but at least it would be a step forward. Thank you, Leah. Um, we have another question uh, with an introduction, this time from Pamela Lynn Colon from the US Virgin Islands. Um, she was recently appointed to chair the U.S. Virgin Islands Advisory Committee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights. Uh, so they have, she, she announces that they will have their initial meeting on November the 2nd. And uh, she would like to explore a report uh, created jointly by all the territory advisory committees on a topic affecting all U.S. territories. So I think she shares She's giving us her contact information. I will share it with all of you after the panel. She shares uh, the, the interest of continuing uh, working these issues uh, jointly with all the territories. And she asks the following questions. The following question, have we made any progress in getting the administration's Department of Justice 
to abandon its defense of the insular cases. I guess I'll jump in on that one, maybe. Uh, <laughs> That's your baby, maybe. Neil. <laughs> yeah, okay, unfortunately you. not. Uh, I mean, uh, my organization, along with Latino Justice, Hispanic Federation, ACLU, and uh, more than a dozen other civil rights organizations, uh, leaders in Congress like Chairman Grijalva, Congressman Plaskett, and other um, Puerto Rican members of Congress, uh, pressed quite hardly for um, the Biden administration to recognize what uh, one would think would be straightforward, which is uh, that racist decisions like the insular cases, just like racist decisions of Plessy or Dred Scott or uh, Korematsu should have no place in our law, um, uh, as, as Justice Gorsuch recently said. Uh, and yet, uh, despite that, um, the Justice Department continued to oppose calls to overrule the insert cases, continues to prop them up, um, which you know, provides a signal to uh, other political actors that it's okay to discriminate against residents of the territories. Similar call was made with respect to the Bio Madera decision, where President Biden actually promised during the campaign to stop defending uh, uh, discrimination against Puerto Ricans in court. Um, and the president uh, chose not to do that. Um, did come out and say that no, uh, uh, no one in the United States should be treated as a second-class citizen. Um, and then here, you know, a year later, you have his uh, Justice Department not only arguing uh, that it's okay to treat people as second-class citizens, but even to deny them citizenship uh, entirely. Uh, so while the Biden administration has done uh, a lot of good things uh, in advancing issues in the territories on these fundamental issues of uh, whether, uh, whether there should continue to be a colonial framework that governs where uh, Congress can govern without um, any voting representation from the territories, where the president can act uh, without any voting, say, from residents of the territories, uh, that still all remains in place. Uh, you know, he's got another couple of years left. Um, so we'll continue pushing and fighting and um, hope that the Justice Department and the Biden administration as a whole will do even more to address these longstanding issues because the time really is now to act on these. It's been, it's been way too long. This is 2022. Next year actually marks the 125th anniversary of Puerto Rico, Guam, and some of the other territories being part of the United States. How long is too long? Um, I think that that's just about long enough. Thank you, Neil. Um, uh, moving on to another question. Um, it starts with a great comment. This is an excellent panel uh, from Annette Jimenez Colet from Puerto Rico. Due to the singular characteristics of US territories, can we unite and organize to present a concise position regarding this discriminatory US policy? Yes. Yeah, it's, it's sure. Right. <laughs> yeah we'll sign on to that. <laughs> OK, uh, another question this time uh, from uh, a Puerto Rican uh, news reporter, Selimar Adames. Thank you for listening to the panel, Selimar. Uh, she says, this panel has been eye-opening in terms of the common problems in the territories. I've read some of the cases and I wasn't really aware of the impact on the other territories besides Puerto Rico. My question is, if the cases were overturned, then we would need to go back again to the courts to fight one by one on the different issues that give us discriminatory treatment. I can jump in on that one. I mean, I, I think as, as Leah was suggesting earlier, um, just as uh, Brown overruling Plessy was the beginning of what really became a political conversation around issues of racial segregation, um, overruling the insular cases would similarly spark a, a more serious political discussion around um, all of these issues that the territories face from um, questions as fundamental as self-determination and decolonization to questions of federal benefits to uh, questions about just having a say um, in military expansion um, in some of these islands. Uh, there's just almost every issue that the federal government deals with with respect to the territories comes down to that, that fundamental lack 
of political participation that's the root of uh, the American democratic project. Um, and fundamental to that and, and what we're working to address is the failure of the United States as a whole to recognize that it has a colonies problem. And if you don't recognize that there's a problem, how can you solve it? And so having the Supreme Court take up the question of the insular cases and begin to grapple with this recognition that America has a colonies problem that it created and it has a responsibility of solving, I think is the path forward to addressing a broad range of issues impacting people in the territories today. Yes, so um, I think uh, this has been uh, a great panel. I'm really uh, interested in continuing the conversation. Uh, we've had a lot of people connected throughout the whole panel from different the different territories. So I think it's a mission accomplished in terms of uh, the kind of uh, education and uh, exposure that we wanted and in Migrajuris, uh, from Migrajuris we wanted to provide uh, on this particular issue. I think there are a lot of uh, themes that we have pending uh, to go more in depth. Uh, the issue on militarization, mm -hmm. uh, because it's something that's also a common a common issue in Puerto Rico, uh, in other uh, territories, um, and the issue of self-determination. I think uh, from that issue uh, stems a, a whole complexity of citizenship issues, the presidential vote, the status uh, in terms of the relationship to the United States. So I think that um, this calls for, for a continuation of of these conversations and uh, talking from my graduates, uh, I'm very grateful uh, for all of you to have joined the panel, uh, to have made uh, the time to, to talk and, and share your experiences. I think it's very, uh, uh, it's priceless for me and from other people that have uh, wrote to me, that have written to me over the, over the phone, uh, saying the same thing like, in, we have always uh, talked about these issues from the Puerto Rican perspective, uh, but to know that uh, the other territories uh, face similar challenges, similar uh, policy issues in their own complexity, uh, but that we have a common ground is really eye-opening. So I thank you so much, Brian, uh, Neil, Leah, Sheila, and Charles. Uh, for taking the time to talk. And I don't know if you have any uh, closing words that you would like to share with the audience. Um, I would like to follow up quickly on something that Neil just said about uh, the United States has a colonies problem. You know, when I was growing up in Puerto Rico to say, to mention colonization was almost taboo. It was like, it was a bad word. And so, you know, and then those that did were politically persecuted. And so I think we need to call things by their name. And just as we need to do that with other things in life, um, we have to call racism by its name. We also have to call colonization by its name and we can have different opinions on how to solve it. And we might not be in accordance with one another. And some people want one thing and other people want something else. That's another conversation. But now I, it pleases me at least to see that um, it's not that restrictive anymore. It's not a bad word necessarily. And it's also the truth. It's the, it's the reality. So in order to solve a problem, you have, to, you have to point to it and you have to call it by its correct name. And then people can have different opinions about how to solve it, but you have to be able to call it by its name. So I appreciate that Neil kind of like brought that up um, so that I can make that comment. And thank you so much to everybody who participated. Yeah, thank you so much to Equally American, uh, Neil, uh, and all your, your staff as well for the coordination and uh, for the invitation of panelists and uh, Leah and Latino Justice as well for the support and the communications effort uh, for uh, amplifying the networks uh, so that we could have more audience uh, from, from the United States as well to join us in the panel. Uh, does anybody else have any uh, 
closing words that they would like to share? Yeah, I have just one comment. It's, I still believe in the United States Constitution. Mm -hmm. I understand America's history and it, it has its uh, bad parts, obviously, but we have the ability to address it. So I have faith. I think that in the end, you know, the, you know, I think Obama said it, the arc of justice bends towards freedom. And I think in this particular case, I think uh, just by bringing these things up and addressing them, I, you know, you have to have faith. Otherwise you, uh, <laughs> you don't, you, you go to despair. And I think in this case, I have faith that the United States will eventually do the correct thing and the Supreme Court will do the correct thing. Whether it's in this case, I'm not too sure, but whatever. <laughs> Thank you. So definitely from uh, from Equal American and Latino Justice and Micro Judis, we will be monitoring uh, the case and making sure that we keep our public informed on the development of the case. Thank you. I just want to... Uh, express my gratitude. Thank you for having the voice of the Mariana Islands, um, a part of this panel. And I really do hope that we continue building solidarity and conversation around the, these issues because, uh, you know, we're not alone. And sometimes it can feel that way, especially coming from an island so far away. Um, so thank you very much. And Sizos Masi. Thank you, Adi. Thank you, Brian. Okay. Great to see you. Great. Thank you for, for being here, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a good night and have, have a, a great day. day.